Good afternoon, everyone. everyone. Uh, on behalf of Joseph Bahout, who could not be with us today, director of the St. Ferris Institute for Public Policy and international lecturer at the American University of Beirut, we are pleased to welcome you to this discussion centered around the Lebanon on Central Project. Led by Dean Sharp from the LSE and Mike Falhaj from the LEU, Lebanon on Central aims to provide a comprehensive understanding of the October 2019 uprising by creating a student-led archive. This archive not only contextualizes the uprising within its geographical and historical backdrop, but also preserves its essence for future readings of the events that unfolded uh, in 2019. Central to this project is a publicly accessible website that features an array of creative content which Dean will briefly present to us before we delve into today's discussion. We are privileged to have such a valuable resource at our disposal, and today's workshop will offer an opportunity to make use of the Lebanon Unsettled Project to unravel the complexities of the October 2019 uprising and its relationship to space and time. Allow me first to introduce the participants joining us for today's uh, discussion. Dean Sharp. Uh, holds a PhD from City University of uh, New York and currently serves as a visiting fellow in Human Geography and Environment at the LSC. The LSC being one of the, uh, the sponsor of this, of, this, uh, of this project. Dean has made significant contribution to the field of urbanism and the study of the Arab uprisings. In 2016, he co-edited Beyond the Square, Urbanism and the Arab Uprisings a book that sheds light on the complex dynamics between urban spaces and social movements. Today, we are fortunate to have Dean as an investigator on the Lebanon Unsettled Project. Mike Farhat. Uh, Mike Farhat is a visiting associate professor in the Faculty of Architecture and Design at the LAU. She is renowned for her expertise in the field of Islamic art and architecture and holds a PhD from Harvard University. Her research focuses on the early modern period, delving into the architectural history of the Middle East. May is also the co-investigator of the Lebanon Unsettled Project. Her sound knowledge and insights will enrich our understanding of the historical context surrounding the October 2019 uprising. Sarah Yassin, on my left, is a landscape architect and urbanist. She has lectured at the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the AUB and is a founding member of the ESG School of Architecture. As a published author, Sarah Lili has contributed to the field through her writings on topics such as urban historic landscapes and landscape conservation. She has also been politically engaged in Beirut since 2013 and played a pivotal role in the award-winning Daily uh, campaign. She also was a candidate for the, in Beirut for the legislative elections in 2022. She will talk about her contribution to the Lebanon Unsettled Project, showcasing her own collection of sound archives, capturing the essence of these October moments. And last but not least, Professor Mona Harel is a leading authority in the field of urban studies in Lebanon and beyond. Mona holds the position of Professor of Urban Studies and Politics at the AUB. She is also co-founder and research lead at the renowned Beirut Urban Lab. We are honored to have, honored to have Professor Mona Harel as a discussant in our workshop. Her extensive expertise in urban studies and politics will undoubtedly enrich our conversations and provide valuable insights. Uh, a few words on the sequence of the discussion. First, May will provide a genealogy of the October 2019 uprising by exploring the long durée of social movements in Lebanon going back to the 19th century. Second, Sarah Lili will, as a contrary, address the immediacy of the uprising by sharing and analyzing one of the sound bites she recorded during her participation to the demonstrations. Third, Dean will address the geographies of the protests and the way space, urban space, void or dense and populated and transient places like highways inform the movement or were transformed by it. I will then shortly conclude on the way I tried to document these moments through a liter literary non-fiction narrative using the situationist preferred tool to capture the spirit of the streets and its layers of emotions, 
psychogeography. And finally, as a discussion of this panel, Mona will then have the freedom to provide critique, pose questions, or offer her reactions to the perspective and insights shared during the session. But first, I'm going to give the floor to Tim, so he takes us through a quick overview of this great resource that just came online, the Lebanon Consulted website. Great, thank you so much, Kimi. Thank you, everyone, for coming and taking your time to um, spend with us this afternoon. I really appreciate uh, you being here and to get to share this, this project with you. Um, as you can see, there, it's uh, accessible on lebanonunsettled.org. Please uh, take your time at, at a desktop to look through the, the various elements, and I'm going to briefly just touch upon a few of those. But firstly, just to give you some context for this project, and in the name of accountability and transparency, which of course are very important for the topic at hand, this was funded by uh, the Emirates grant that came through the London School of Economics Middle East Centre through a competitive grant to link up LSE with any Arab university. Um, and I proposed this project um, to link with Buzek um, in Kasli for many reasons, but two essential ones, one being the geography of the university. I was very interested in um, the broader dynamics of social mobilizations in 2019 that went out of the core of Beirut in particular, something that I'll touch on um, a bit further later. Um, and then also in turn of uh, its physical campus location, the students that it attracts. Um, unfortunately, we're not launching this project at the set because it wasn't a very smooth collaboration and I can talk more about that in the Q&A. I will say that I certainly appreciate AUB's uh, dedication and uh, commitment to freedom of thought and analytical and critical thought uh, and to give my deep thanks to Camille for organising this event, to IFI for hosting it, um, to Sarah for her contribution to the website, to uh, Mona um, Hart, who I've uh, read for years now and, and met for several times, but actually don't think I've ever been on a panel discussion before, so this is a, a, a special moment for me in that respect as well. And a, a huge thanks to May, um, who's seen this project to fruition. Um, so thank you, thank you, May. Um, so the website, you know, this is uh, very much an educational tool with two core aspects. One is based on the discussions and outputs of the workshop that was held in July of last year at Pazet in which students produced two mapping exercises focused around October 2019. Um, so one workshop was led by Dr. Fadi Shaya, um, and it utilized the Victorian uh, methodologies, namely through the framework of actor network theory, to trace the social entanglements of 2019. Um, if you want to know a bit more about actor network theory, I can talk through it a bit more in the Q&A but to say that they produced seven uh, individual re reflections, each of the participants in the workshop, but again, you can go through the workshop that, um, website that talked through the various elements um, of 2019 and their experience of it. The second um, aspect was a common mapping, very much influenced by situationist thought, which is uh, also in hand with psychogeographies that can be will also reflect upon and talk about a bit later today. Um, and this workshop was led by two Uzzet graduates, Maria Basile and Mark El Samarani. Um, and we really traced here the very spatial legacies of 2019. And in the website, each of the elements or selected elements are broken down, explained and contextualized to really draw out the various spatial legacies that 2019 left um, for us to think about uh, and remark on. Um, then a final central element of the project was to kind of, was to historicise this moment of 2019. 
Um, so we created a, a series of videos, two of which we're going to show you uh, sections of today. Uh, one um, that touches on this period of the Amayet, which were a series of protests that went from the 1820s to 1861, that um, May will talk about in more detail. Another video through the series of interviews that we did on the geographies, of which I'm going to um, expand on later. So there's this uh, historical aspect that we really wanted to interrogate, and as I say, this is very much an educational tool. So we selected key literature for our hopes, students and researchers to draw upon to understand what exists and then hopefully not do too much repeating of uh, inventing the wheel so that you can do, dive in deeper to these periods and understand what literature it exists. Um, and of course, this is a very fast uh, and rapidly developing literature, especially after 2011, the Arab uprising. Social mobilizations of that particular moment, but also historically, have become a fast trending historic, uh, scholarly area. And there has been, since this period, a vast production of, of scholarship. So this one aspect of this project was to also cut and shape some of that scholarship so it's more visible and easier to digest than uh, Mayette in particular, but we, we interviewed um, some of the scholars there, um, select some of the literature, and, and take out also images and certain archival documents for you again to, to engage with and, and uh, hopefully take further and, and push this research to, to new horizons. Um, and on that note, I'll pass the name. Thank you, Dean. Uh, my, I'm going to play a video, so it's been yeah. good to start with your uh, intervention. It will also be the occasion for you to. So it will also be the occasion for you to see to have a look at your website.
rising in their historical and geographical depths, and to locate or identify archives that can assist in the creation of the documentary history of popular movements in Lebanon. That would include written documents, photographs, maps, paintings. Now, however, you know, the COVID pandemic and the closure of libraries forestalled our ability to conduct such a comprehensive uh, search. However, I did, you know, a few attempts to access archives, um, and I have to speak about my, uh, my experience in accessing archives at Fizek, which where I was teaching at the time, and I was faced with resistance in having direct access to archival material. So there were no finding guides or complete inventories that would help researchers to identify pertinent documents efficiency. So basically, to put a request, briefly uh, outlining the topic that you're researching and then librarians will bring you the documents. So you don't have direct access to that box where these documents are located. So uh, I have similar experience at the Arab Image Foundation where I had to scroll through thousands of photographs in order to locate records of protests from the 1920s onward. And there were not many. However, they do exist and most likely in the private collections of photographers who were active during the period so I have to see, you know, by far the most useful and accessible archives were the collections at VUB, which hold, among, among others, important archives from student protest movements. And here I have to um, express my thanks to Samar Mihati, who's head of archives and special collections, for really facilitating my access to the um, to archives uh, at VUB. So all this to say that um, building a documentary history of popular movements in Lebanon is not at all evident. And it's fraught with issues of accessibility, availability, and time. This is a project that would definitely require a larger team and far more time than we had available. So to echo John Charcraft, whose book, Popular Politics and the Making of the Modern Middle East, which is a sweeping account of popular mobilizations in the Middle East, contentious politics in the region played an important role in the process of historical change and cannot be ignored in the writing of history of the region. Lebanon has a long and complex history of popular protest movements, uprisings, demonstrations, boycotts, riots, strikes, all expressions of social, political, and cultural contentions against certain policies or course of actions and they unfolded both in rural and urban contexts. Significant social and political gains, such as labor and women's rights and education programs, resulted from decades of protest over the need for social and economic reforms. Now, the archive uh, section of the website introduces these popular movements in the form of historical chronology, short narratives focusing on key moments, bibliographies of quality scholarship, and a small selection of images, photos, and videos. Now, in the um, in our historical chronology, we decided to place greater emphasis on the Amiyat, about which you have heard a you know, short video, which are a series of peasants' revolts in Lebanon that took place between 1821, the date of the first peasant revolt, and 1861, which marked the end of the Fusil one peasant revolt, but also that marks the beginning of the violence that erupted uh, between uh, Maronite and Jewish uh, communities. Now, during this period, peasants took political matters into their hands, got organized, and push, pushed forward for reforms. Now, although these revolts have received attention in histories of Lebanon, they are not known by the, gen by the young generation of even students and activists, such as those who participated in the project's mapping uh, workshop. So that's why we felt that even though this is further part in, in history, they really needed to focus on uh, these protests. Now, these Amiyans, which assumed the form of collective protest and rebellions, challenged the legitimacy of the feudal hereditary nobility, known as the Mufatajis, who controlled Mount Lebanon's tax districts, the Mufatar, and acted as tax collectors on behalf of any 
von die Vollkost aus 1912 Uhr. Uh, that stands out in terms of plan, it's, it's, a, it's, it's called the tramway boycott, where simply uh, citizens of Vero decided to boycott the use of the tramway, which was managed, of course, by a French company. Many of these strikes and, and protests were directed towards uh, um, companies, whether, you know, uh, that were foreign, primarily French. So the World of 1931 stands up in terms of planning, organization, scope, and impact. And starting in Beirut, the world was rapidly spread to Damascus and other cities and directly challenged mandatory powers and uh, who feared massive disobedience along the Gambian model. You know, they were very much concerned about uh, Gambia's work in India. So directed, these were directed against concessionary imperialism, imperialism. And it marked the first time that Beirut's diverse social classes and confessional communities came to, together to act and speak as, as one. Now, um, we chose to restrict ourselves to four or five images for each period due to space restrictions. But as these images here suggest, a thorough search in the newspapers and journals of the period can lead substantial written and visual records to document the protest movement during the, the mandate period. These have only been tackled uh, very briefly, so uh, there's still much work to be done to understand these, these man various protest manifestations within the urban, within the urban context. Um, now, uh, of course, another moment that we chose to highlight is the massive 1943 manifestations that followed the, uh, you know, the capture of uh, members of parliament and president and, of, and by the French and uh, this also uh, is featured here with a short video. It's not easy to locate images from this period. So I have to say uh, it's a miracle that I was able to find um, images of this tramway boycott in Ajanda uh, and Mara, but I'm sure there are any more. Uh, events 
so any attempt to find um, studies of how these clashes with barricades, how they manifested themselves within the urban space in Beirut was almost impossible to find. So there hasn't been any study yet how these events actually uh, evolved uh, within Beirut. Now, many people, and many people alive from this period, so I think uh, a kind of oral history would be uh, important uh, to really still gather um, uh, witness accounts from, from this uh, period. So, um, and one of the finds were few paintings, which I found were extraordinary, especially Khalil Zreb's Marin Banding, which is in the Islamic Maritime Collection, that illustrates the arrival of the Marines in 1958, following the request of Henry Shamroon, who very much feared um, or exasperated uh, the fear of um, uh, you know, Arab nationalism and um, so this is his response to the arrival of this massive armada on the seashore of uh, Haldi and another one which marks the moment when a journalist was killed in downtown following which you know, the um, mass, you know, the, the, um, the crisis, the crisis, uh, the crisis evolved. And there's a third one um, that shows women protest in Tunisia Bay. So um, all of these have not yet been studied, and I think they're, they do deserve some attention. Um, So I'm just going to rapidly finish with the 1967-1975 period, beginning with the Arab defeat against Israel in 1967 and uh, 1975, the eruption of the civil war, which is a very poignant period for me because this is uh, early childhood and which, for, of course, terminates with the, um, the eruption of the civil war with all of us who've experienced it are, are, are very much traumatized by it. Um, now, in retrospect, of course, the years leading to the Civil War were rife with social unrest, cultural turmoil, and political radicalization. The Shihad era had failed to del deliver on its promise of social reform, and significant disparities still existed between Beirut and Lebanon's southern and northern regions. So, Lebanon in the 1960s and 1970s, so against this golden era, you know, memory that we have, experienced the widest and most long-standing wave of social conflict in its post-colonial history. There was a remarkable development in urban labor mobilizations and the student movement between 1968 and 1975. So by the 1970s, in the, in the face of severe police repressions, strikes and protests gathering thousands of participants became commonplace. So Lebanon was developed by many cleavages on the eve of the civil war. And here we chose to highlight key moments that are, uh, you know, have been forgotten. And again, you know, the civil war has created a kind of uh, amnesia. Among these is the, uh, the land war factory strike, um, the 1972 and 1973 regime factory strike, the 1974 student protest at the UP that were extensive and prolonged, and finally, you know, the, the fishermen's strike that took place in Saiba in 1975 and was practically a prologue to the eruption of the civil war. So, so that brings me, you know, to the end of this uh, archives. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for this long period perspective of social movements. Uh, now, very abruptly, we're going to move to the immediacy of the of the 2019 uh, uprising, uh, and with uh, Salahi, uh, who is uh, who has.
contributed to the website with a, with a very uh, interesting sound archive uh, that she recorded herself during the demonstration. Sarah Lili, the floor is yours. Um, hi everyone, thank you for being here. I'm happy to take part in this uh, great discussion with this wonderful panel. Thank you Camille for inviting me, Dean and May for this very important work, and Mona for picking our brains with tough questions. Uh, I'm going to play one of the pieces that are featured on the website. It's one of the five pieces. Uh, just a bit of background about what you're going to hear. Uh, this audio is a five minute more or less uh, piece. It was recorded by myself on May 6, 2020. Uh, and it's a procession from uh, Sancton Mall, the North Square in Tripoli, to uh, the Babel Lummel Cemetery. Just a bit of context. On May 6, uh, 2020, protesters defied the COVID-19 lock-in and drove from all across Lebanon to Tripoli uh, to pay tribute to the death of one of the Tripoli non-protesters, Fawaz Salman, who had lost his life on the around Sahtan Mall, around the North Square, during very violent repressions by the Lebanese army. So I took part in this procession and this drive from Beirut to Tripoli and recorded this audio with my phone while walking from Sahtun Nur to his family residence, which is around the cemetery, Dabar Rabel. So let's play the audio and then we'll take it from there.
ministers, as I mentioned, from across Lebanon, um, as they had arrived from to the um, the residence of the person, the protester who had passed away on the second day after her year. Uh, and the reason why I find it very rich and interesting is because uh, you have this overlapping of religious chants, uh, some communist chants, but also a call and response between the sister and the family of the person who had passed away who were situated on the balcony and the protesters on the ground. And um, the diversity and the overlap and rhyming of, of chants. If you listen carefully, when the religious uh, slogans take over, you have the, the, and if you know the geography of the protesters, you have the, the, the secular Beirutis or uh, who, I'm saying Beirutis because I could identify them, who were trying to, you know, uh, control the, the chanting. So, this is one of the five uh, pieces that you'll find on the website. Another one is from October 18th. Uh, one is from a Blockage of the Ring. And the other is of a woman, Women's March. And the last one is of three converging marches uh, that were taking place. So on the significance of this uh, archive and how it, it, it was born, as Camille and Dean mentioned, this is a primary archive, so a row Low Art Archive, uh, and it's a first-person account. There was no objectivity. I was in the streets, taking a part of everything that was happening as a as a protester, not affiliated to any group or any movement. I was just there, and I had my phone, and I was recording. At 6 p.m. on Thursday, uh, October 17th, I was in a cab in the ring tunnel when I heard the sound of protesters who had closed the road to cars leaving the tunnel. They were chanting, Thawra, Thawra, Revolution, Revolution. So I heard these chants from within the tunnel, and I immediately understood the significance of what was happening and joined the streets, joined the protests. On the second day, I began recording. I felt that a still or a moving image or a video would not do justice to the power of what I was hearing in the city. So I began recording every day, and that's how this uh, audio archive was born. It's about two to three hundred audio pieces, mostly taken from October 18 to uh, August uh, 2021, one year after the, uh, the August last uh, commemoration. Um, from October 2019 to March 2020, the streets uh, became a very rich soundtrack composed of protest songs, rap songs, call and response, slogan chanting, cursing, and banging on metal structures, all rhyming together forming this uh, soundscape archive. Megaphones circulated among protesters, and with time, some became known as Hadafin chanters for leading slogans and encouraging the crowd to respond. Chanters composed new songs reflecting daily incidents, the progression of the demands, and the push and pull between protesters and security forces. For example, at the turning point during the protest, when former President Micharon asked to negotiate with the revolution or October 17th representative, the response was through this chant on the street. A sharp butale polayufa with we the people demand will not negotiate. This was a way for protesters of passing the message to politicians as you had uh, social media heavily present as well as regular mainstream and alternative media present on the street and broadcasting. On the streets, we heard or protesters chanted uh, some uh, Lebanese political and satirical songs by Marcel Khalife, Ziad Rahmani, but also the Lebanese version of the historic protest song Bella Ciao and some slogans from the 2011 Arab Spring um, the people want the fall of the regime, a shabri is called the Nizam. We also heard the song Saura 2011 by rapper Yadayis Beg, lasting from protest squares, calling for political reform against confessionalism in Lebanon. Uh, also, chants, the chants from the Ustain movement, Rabbi Hedkon, Kalonia Mikelon, and slogans from the 2005 Caesar uprising, namely Askar al -Hamin. So, but for me, as an observer, as a participant, what was new to October 17 was the use of the word Thawra from the protesters. 
and then eventually they became known, they started referring to themselves as the Thuwar, but also the media at some point was referring to the protesters as the Thuwar, the Thuwar, the Thuwar, the Thuwar, etc. Uh, this audio is important in that it reflects the interse intersectionality uh, of the uprising and its demands. The chance, the chance for spatial, they depended on time and space, and they often changed according to day and location. They also mentioned successful activism, such as there was a, a, a chant about saving values or the coast of Beirut, other chants were also uh, who spoke of Bisri Valley and everything that was happening in uh, around Saida with the Bisri, Bisri Dam and the whole uh, campaign to stop the dam. Um, and the lyrics uh, of the chants were uncensored. They uh, enumerated all the ills to civil war, the security apparatus, sectarianism, and failed economic policies. Protesters were also fearless, cursing and naming and shaming all politicians became a recurring chant. One of the chants, the first one, El Hal, is a listing of uh, all, the, all the politicians with the word El Hal, El Hal. Um, the soundscape was also representative of the broad spectrum of protesters' political ideas or affiliations uh, or sentiments um, on a left to ring. Uh, left to right spectrum, anarchists, people calling for riots, communist, communist party, it was also a generational uh, participation, uh, slogans chanting against the class system, capitalism, some more pro-federalism, etc. Sometimes chants felt like duels and tensions would rise between different groups, but the violence of security forces and the slogan Kilon Yani Kilon acted like equalizers to come down the you know, the, uh, the feeling of antagonism that could have arise between different groups. Uh, protesters also chanted for better representation, diversity and equality, organizing marshal, marches for women's rights, migrant workers' rights, to play, displaced political asylum seekers' rights, LGBTQ rights, and also chanted against homophobia and transphobia specifically. The soundscape is also a record of state violence. It's, uh, it, it records the intensifying violence and repression from security forces, the counter-revolution that was put in place by the security forces and the political oligarchy, and also reflects the shifting in protesters' tactics from peaceful uh, Sudmiye to more aggressive Sudmiye. Chants were also a tribute to, the, to those who had lost their lives during the protest or who had lost an eye after being injured by rubber bullets used by parliamentary police and general, general security forces. We can also hear in the soundscape noise of tear, tear gas canisters hitting the ground, screams of injured protesters, ambulances, sirens, banging against metal gates placed to guard access to parliament, but also sounds of stone thrown on parliamentary police as a response to the use of civilian violence. Um, to, as a response, protesters chanted Shabiha Shabiha in unison when violence would occur. The soundscape is also um, reflects on the decentralization of, of the October 17 moment. Squares across Lebanon were filling up with protesters where there was no public space Protesters created one, roundabouts or voice on their bridges became protest squares appropriated by the people. Protesters also chanted saluting one another. You, As you heard in the Tripoli uh, audio piece, uh, there was this, uh, and uh, reflecting on what Mary was saying, this sense of uh, common cause uh, of respect and of uh, brotherhood in a way, sisterhood. Uh, where protesters chanted saluting other protest squares across Lebanon from Nabatiye to Farimme to Beirut, etc., which uh, we can argue made this uprising national and decentralized. And at times, as, as someone who was, of course, objective, uh, sorry, subjective as a participant, uh, felt like the whole country had become one big protest and one single connected square. Thank you very much, Sanadi. Very instructive and very precious to have these sound bites, uh, and they are available on this website, I think. Uh, now we move from listening to the, to the protest, we move to trying to see, to, to feel the protest, how it interacts 
uh, with, with space at the end of corridors. The geography of the 2019 protests can be uh, can be analyzed uh, at different scales. The first one, the international scale, as I said earlier, many of the country's regional capitals uh, were involved, uh, from Nzota uh, and Fimpoli to the north down to Su and Namati in the south, and then from Beirut and Copa and other coastal cities uh, to the to 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 to, to the bar. Uh, And this in return means that also all of the country's communities were also involved in the process. Um, when you start zooming in, there is also the importance of protests that happened along and on main communication axes, such as highways and, and, and other regional roads. Uh, this can be explained in, uh, by the fact that in the revolution you know, process, you need, to, to, you need the existing system to get interrupted, to get stopped, to stop. Uh, in order to start imagining something new, and uh, when the normal, when the state of normalcy is, uh, is is unjust, is unfair, and it needs to change, then the, the, the easiest way to interrupt how the system functions is to interrupt communication loops. It automatically interrupts everything else uh, uh, as, as a consequence. What? Started or what made this uprising revolutionary is the uh, the mass strike, if you want, which was Rome's uh, uh, crochets, and that was beyond the squares. And it actually, it, it is what uh, made the squares possible. That's by by not allowing people to get to work, that people flock to the to the squares. Uh, but I think this is an aspect that is uh, that needs to be explored more in thinking about this link between. Uh, uh, the, the geography of uh, uh, blocking roads and labor, and how strike or the return of the mass strike in different ways uh, was actually at the core of what happened, even if it's, it wasn't declared by you know a general uh, uh, federation of unions or uh, it was indirect, but it was really the core of what happened. Uh, the only thing and the best thing I remember about the protest is experiencing a space that wasn't accessible before, which is the road, the highway. I've never been uh, as a pedestrian to the highway. And it was, uh, it was very symbolic for me because uh, finally we claimed a public space, which is public, and we had access to a public space. Uh, this is the the highlight of the protest for me. And um, on another hand, uh, it was also an opportunity to think that we didn't have actually um, uh, public spaces to protest at, so the street was the only way we had to go there. And also the symbolism of cutting the roads, uh, having everything stopping because we had to stop everything and look up to what, at the situation then. So yeah, this is for me the the highlight of the protest. For me, the fact that it was decentralized, that there was the, I think there were different aspects. There were gatherings and marches and protests in, in, the, in the Martyr Square in Beirut, in Tripoli, in the big squares. There were also the people who saw all of these uh, gatherings on social media, on TV, and we're like, okay, we're doing the same thing. They took, uh, they brought tires, they started burning tires all around the highway because we want the protest to go on. So um, they did that and they promoted that you can protest from anywhere. So people started going out to the highway that's closest to the, their city. Like in our case in Batumun, we kind of closed the roads, put up blockades, closed it with our own cars because we didn't want anyone to go to work the next day. And um, I think the importance of this was that People were not always able to go to Beirut 
or access these big squares because of the, the reason we were protesting was financial, was economic unrest, and everything was uh, the prices were inflated. So uh, to afford to go to these protests uh, would mean that we, will, we, we don't need to protest. So the fact that these locations were spread out and available uh, in every, almost every area, uh, that's very significant. Also, social media played like a very important role. Uh, it helped us like interconnect or or like uh, group together all of these different locations, and we kind of communicated. We saw what was happening over there and kind of reacted to it. The revolt uh, made us see our city in a different. So that was just a, a section of, um, I don't know if the videos that said on the website, Clara, and two other videos as well that delve into more the historical aspects. But this geographical one is um, something that I just wanted to remark on uh, in a bit more depth because this is some of the ongoing work that will carry on past the launch of the website that is more an educational tool and the geographical aspect that goes to uh, the core of my own work. Um, and, you know, some of the geographical significances of this process movement were picked up on those videos that I'm trying to think through a bit more carefully. Um, and the good thing about matching up with an archive is that we can be relatively confident through the, the various uh, scholarly bodies that exist on the various periodizations of uh, revolts in Lebanon, that there is a unprecedented geographical scale, depth and breadth to 2019 that is worth thinking about more carefully and understanding, you know, what is it that has happened in the country that produced these patterns? What processes are underlying right, these patterns and processes? What can this tell us about the political economy and social life uh, of Lebanon? But equally, what can it tell us about how Lebanon is situated globally, and perhaps you know what it can tell us about the state of our world? So you know, throughout these different scalar processes, trying to think about what has produced these patterns, why now, um, and why this form? What are people relating to in relation to their space, and what are they um, revolting about? Um, in relation to urban conditions. So one of the things that comes up a lot, came up in the workshop a lot, um, and it comes up in the literature when people are trying to explain the uh, geography, and one of, indeed, like its most stark characteristics is that 2019 is decentralized. And I don't think that decentralization is the right geographical concept in which we should understand 2019. Um, and I'm trying to think through it with this concept of centralized diffusion, but I don't think that I'm actually going to land there. So just to highlight that this is very much ongoing work. I'm interviewing people while I'm here, and um, still wrestling with the, the scholarly um, work of protests globally, but also like theoretical spatial concepts in which we can understand a protest movement that had clear centers, and this is why decentralization for me is not the right term as was expressed in many of the interviews, right? Beirut was the main event. Marxist Square around the Surai was very much the center of 2019. But at the same time, they had other centers that included places like Tripoli. Um, and then what I'm particularly uh, fascinated about is the way the highway was used for protests. Um, not just the blocking, of um, the blocking of, 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 of cars sorry, and, and mobility, but equally the way that uh, highways themselves got transformed into public spaces, into places of play, of food, uh, of preparing food, um, of having discussions. Um, and the, many of the remarks from the workshop that we had, right, this real stark surprise of what it meant to walk on a highway um, and a, a complete reinterpretation um, 
understanding experience of when that moment happened in which people uh, suddenly were, were present in the highway as pedestrians. Um, and that idea of transforming space to transform society. So these are some of the threads that um, yeah, I, was, uh, I was thinking through. And just like this project, you know, this is very much rooted in a work that I did in 2016 that also wanted to think through um, the process of 2011 and the Arab uprisings, where most spatial analysis focuses on uh, the metropolitan square, um, the, the metropolitan public space, right? Obviously, for the Arab uprisings, it was Tahrir, but you know, we can go through the various countries where revolts happened, and most spatial analysis focused on that central square. But, um, and taking the, the Arab uprisings just to make some very brief remarks on that, you know, Sidi Bouzid, which is where Mohammed Bouazid is uh, circling the nation, and many people. You know, the mark is the opening was 265 kilometers from the capital Tunis, and it's these provincial areas, um, these peri urban areas um, that were actually the main base for the protests, and then it shifted. Uh, and you see that happen um, a lot. So, again, looking at these patterns of processes and then trying to think through well, what are the processes that are driving these patterns? You know, what are the underlying structures? So, some of the work that um, I'm trying to think about in terms of what led to these types of patterns um, of Jeladi and Zou as like two locus in particular of process is then to match up right what has happened in Lebanon in terms of the urban processes since in particular the post-war era. Um, and the source of political economy that got installed, that has led to rapid urbanization uh, and the extended urbanization that we've seen. You know, the United Nations estimate, and I'm not sure how credible this statistic is, but in the absence of other data, right? And it, this also gets down to the complexities of what we define as the urban, right? Which is a complex definition within Lebanon and beyond in both academic realms, but also policy. But, you know, if we are to throw out a figure, the UN estimates Lebanon's 86% urban. And you do see, you know, transformations of rural areas and rural life by large shopping malls that are present from, you know, the Befar to the south to the north. Like, there are these transformations of life in those regions. Um, and I think it is significant, for instance, that one of the early signs of 2019 of the pressures that were building in Lebanon was the self immolation of a taxi driver in Kura, in the north, right? Who, um, you know, and, and a lot of commentators were saying that this is Lebanon's uh, Yazizi moment. That, that, and, and there was a lot, I think, of, that emerged that bubbled to the surface of the social and economic pressures that were building. But I think his sort of uh, of job and work again that is showing that urbanization of life and then the ways in which you know the, uh, the political economies here have shifted from uh, various industrial activities and state based to more uh, activities like cement for real estate um, construction and the circulation of those jobs of taxis of shopping malls um, and the ways in which certain lifestyles and urban practices are increasingly dominating, right? And thinking through that, what is sometimes termed neoliberal, right, expresses itself as urban form in a certain set of processes, so to call it neoliberal urbanization. And then, to finish that thought, so then how that extends that neoliberal urbanization to certain forms of social claims, so the collapse of basic urban services, of the ability to get certain forms of employment that are expected, uh, the sorts of jobs that now circulate within society, um, and how that then gets articulated on the streets, um, and the forms of protest and the way that people gather. So that the fact that people do gather, especially on highways, and this demand to claim new types of spaces to transform that space. So these are some of the different threads 
um, that I'm trying to wrestle with and think through, to think mainly how that transformation, that urban transformation that's happened, manifested itself in the process that we witnessed in 2019, and how that had such a stark geography compared to what or what preceded it. So. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank you, everyone. And from all these ways of documenting this uprising, I'm going to focus on one of them, uh, which is writing. Uh, and not writing in a journalistic way, but in a literary way. I'm talking about literary text. My way of docu documenting the October uh, 2019 uprising, in which I uh, participated, was to write it into a non-fiction narrative based on a stroll along the Armenian Goro uh, Vashti Street, so from Daura to Riyaz Salah. This text started as a description of the protests. I started late October while I was participating. Uh, so it was a description uh, of the protest, of the slogans that I was hearing, of the tags that I was reading on the walls, uh, and the way the people have transformed, transformed space by diverting its use, détournement, as the situation is called it. Uh, the text then progressively morphed into a condemnation of the source of the people's anger, which was mainly, and everybody agreed on that, corruption. The corruption of the Lebanese political system and the Lebanese political class. That led Lebanon to the situation it was in, uh, in, in 2019. I would like to first take a minute and go back to the meaning of this concept, psychogeography. And I don't say definition, I say meaning, because it's still a fuzzy concept. In 1955, situationist philosopher Guy Debord coined the term psychogeography and defined it, defined it as the study of the precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment, mostly urban, on the emotions and behaviors of the individual. So how space impacts emotions and, and behaviors. Interestingly enough, much later, urban studies are now uh, studying how behaviors and maybe emotions are in turn transforming urban space. For the above, psychogeography was intended to become a human science, science, science which, which main tool would be the dérive urban, urban drift, or walking in the city. Uh, he would stroll the streets of Paris with his fellow situationist uh, friends, looking for shifts in atmospheres and or emotions. He described the, de he described the derive or the drift as a more systematic walk than the 19th century Flannery, which was a nameless romantic walk practiced by poets like Baudelaire and described by Walter Benjamin. Psychogeography almost disappeared in the 70s with the French situationist themselves, only to come back in the 90s in London as a literary device uh, with writers like Ian Sinclair. Sinclair freed himself from the situationist definitions and their Marxist ideologies and used psychogeography as a way to write about the city or to write the city as in transforming it into text, transforming the street the urban text into a literary text by walking in urban or suburban areas. So St. Clair's walks are not aimless drifts. At the contrary, they are usually planned and have clear objectives. The best example uh, of contemporary psychogeography is uh, Jan St. Clair's book, London Orbital. Its objectives are clear. It was to walk on the M25, which is the highway that surrounds London. So we were talking about uh, earlier as never walking on a highway. Well, he walked on a highway for months in order to write 600 pages about this walk. What was the objective of this walk and why did he want to turn the M25 highway into a text, into a literary text? It, is, it was to denounce Thatcher's neoliberalism and its impact on London's suburbia. Uh, also, it was to write a literary text, a novel about London, but also a novel about himself, because it's very, it's also inward-oriented, psychogeography, as it, the name says it. It's inward-oriented, but also outward-oriented, but also about the world. When you talk about the problems of uh, London's suburbia, you talk about 
the problem of all suburbias of the world. Enough with love. In, in my little book, October de Liban, uh, it is therefore as a, as a sensitive and literary, sometimes political approach of, of uh, that, that the city, uh, that I follow the uh, Jan Sinclair's footsteps. I use psychogeography to attempt a transformation of the urban text of Beirut into a literary one. Like him, who denounces Thatcherism, I used my walk along the Armenian Guru Bashi Street from Baba to Bia Salah to denounce the corruption of the uh, Lebanese political class. So there are several steps on this road. Uh, each one of them describes one facet of our corrupt uh, political system. I'm going to list them, I'm not going to go through them all, but for example, we, I, when I start working at, in Daura, I start near the landfill, the landfill of Daura Bashamun. The landfill is a pretext for a chronological digression because psychogeography as a, as, a, as a literary device is also about digression. So the structure of this text is structured by the street. So you digress when you write about something you see. It can be a mundane detail or a huge urban element like a landfill. And then what, along your book, the street will structure your text. Not chronology, not of, of events, not a, a structured outline. It's the street that is the structure. So I start with the Latvi, and the Latvi is a pretext for a chronological uh, uh, digression to the social movements and the, 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 the protests of 2015 with the waste crisis, the Latvi, the first signs of politicization of the civil society with the formation of the first political party, a non-parliamentary, not extra-parliamentary opposition political party, which was at the time the Madinati and the way they ran for municipal then legislative elections. Uh, then I moved to uh, 2019, the 2019 protest, and I remember that the Kulon Yani uh, uh, motto slogan was born in 2015, not in 2019. 2019 took it and made, made it itself, and it grew uh, again in 2019. Uh, it's also a pretext for another digression to 2005, where we remember that in 2005, as Samir Asir says, was not, we call it the Cedars Revolution, but it was not a revolution, because a revolution is when the people turn against their uh, traditional leaders. In 2005, 2005 was a, a sovereignist and independentist movement uh, against uh, the Syrian occupation of Lebanon. And that's why also Samir Asir said it was not a, a revolution, it was an independence intifada. Uh, I walk along the street, I cross the, the Daura roundabout where I can talk about traffic and uh, uh, people uh, and urban sprawl and how people use stays or used to stay and now again uh, spend hours uh, commuting to go to work in Beirut when they live in the suburbs. Um, then I enter the, the Daura neighborhoods with the, all the migrant workers, and I can talk about the kafala problem, uh, that is a, a breach to human rights, and, and uh, uh, that puts domestic workers outside the labor law. Uh, I cross the Beirut River, which is a pretext for a geographical digression this time, and I go up, in my mind, the, the stream of the river to the, to the sources in Tashish and the, the, the top of the mountain, and I, and I see by standing on the bridge above the, 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 the river, I see everything that happens and happened on, on the bed of this river. Uh, how war unfolded, how the river became a border between east and west, how it reflected international borders between the, 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 the global east and the global west, uh, and also how today uh, the, the, the mountain is uh, deforested, how you have illegal carries, and how these illegal quarries lead to the concrete uh, uh, and uh, urbanization of uh, uh, wide urbanization of the of the coastline. Uh, I go through at the end the whole story. The electricity in Lebanon is an epitome of what corruption and clientelism is in Beirut, in Lebanon. Uh, I, on on my right. I see the port, and it's a pretext to talk about how the corrupt system led to the, to the, to the explosion of August uh, 2020. At the end of, toward the end of Guru Street, there is the George Haddad Street, which, is, which, is, which was cut 
in the urban fabric by Solidaire to, 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 to make a difference, to make a separation between the new Beirut of Solidaire and the old Beirut. Uh, and we see here how the center of Beirut has failed to thrive uh, because of uh, financialized uh, urbanism and how the center of Beirut is everywhere except its geographical center today. It's in it's in Jemaizi, it's in Malum Khayel, it's in Tabaris, it's in uh, Lot, in Hamra, everywhere, but it's in geographical center. Uh, then we enter this geographical center of Beirut, we cross the bank association, which is also a, a pretext to talk about the, the financial and economic collapse, collapse and the, the biggest heist of the century, the smartest heist also. Uh, then we cross the Muhammad El Amin Church and the Saint George, uh, the Muhammad El Amin Mosque and Saint George Church. <laughs> yes, I'm uh, And here it's it's a pretext to talk about collusion between religion and state in Lebanon. Parliament. I'm not going to dive into that. And at the end of the street, the Grand Serai standing on the Kantari Hill. So all these. Stops are pretexts to say in a literary way how the city has failed to serve its citizens, how the government has failed to build the city, and how the people got angry by these failures and why they hit the street and how they transformed this place. To conclude, I'm going to read the, a few extracts just to illustrate how literature uh, can in, in document uh, a city and how it transforms uh, the city into or the, the street into a literary text. Uh, first little extract is uh, from uh, the, the, all of them, the three of them are extract from um, uh, articles I wrote in French in Le Le Jour under psychogeography way of thinking and that were translated in Lorient today. So I'm going to read them in English. The first one is when I cross Georges Haddad Street. And I realized all the wealth, the, the stratification, the layers that we have from Daura to this very point, and all the languages that we hear, because psychogeography is about reading and also listening. And Sarah did it very well with her sound bites. So we hear so many languages uh, with all the, the successive immigration until the most recent round one with Ethiopian workers, uh, 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 Sri Lankan workers, and, and uh, uh, Filipinos. Uh, and here I'm going to read this text and how we change the atmosphere completely changes when we cross this huge uh, crossing. Here, the city is no longer. And after hearing words spoken with accents, sentences in Arabic mixed with Amharic, Singhalese, Tagalog, Armenian, Turkish, English, and French, all these Lebanese languages that intermingle and graft each other along the, this Beirut street, this global street. After hearing all this, while passing George Haddad Street, all of a sudden, it is silence. All we hear is the wind and the passing cars, because in the empty center of Beirut, nobody walks, nobody exchanges, nobody talks, nobody lives. So that was one example of telling this whole story in just a few words. The second extract, I'm going to take one more minute, is uh, at the beginning of the street when we cross the river, uh, there is the Marukai train station. And if you remember before August 2019, August, there was a, a, a metal bridge for the train that was linking Beirut to Damascus. And the article is called The Fall of a Bridge. We keep walking past the landfill, the roundabout, and the river toward the geographical center of Beirut. But a few dozen meters on, between the pastel-colored buildings and the arcaded balconies, today's walker will not see the metal railway bridge, which until recently crossed Armenia Street. This long-ago link between the two capitals, Beirut and Damascus, was damaged by decades of neglect finally falling in August 2019 onto the roof of a truck that was passing beneath it, foreshadowing all the collapses to come. Without trains, passengers, or wood, the railways 
and public transport office continues to operate, albeit at no load. And the Lebanese state, like its railway network, has never recovered from the 1975 civil war, now only existing to feed the parasitic administration. I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to give the floor to Mona, who will have the freedom to say, to critique, to question. The floor is yours. Yeah. <laughs> 
humanity center activity is something that I, I care a lot about. At some point, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically, perhaps both me and May, if you see yourself as curators of uh, multiple, because there are a lot of other people's voices, uh, especially in the text I, I had the privilege to read that you kindly shared with me. And the bibliography is amazing in itself. For me, it's great to share this with, a, with an outer audience. But at some point, I felt I feel curating this project to bring things together. And if this is the intent, I think it would be really welcome to put it forth that this is an effort at curating different things happening. Um, Beirut, who 
from uh, from Kassi to what's the relationship of Kassi to Beirut? Yes, that's another question. Definitely. And I love very much the 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 interpretation project because it makes us hear this like I'm not even Ukraine, this is how I felt. And I went to Jenny Tree, but I didn't go to my to my mood. I stayed in Jibail and this is amazing information. But I'm not sure I would call it non-urban or rural or rural. That's my main Thank you. 
feel that sometimes, so it's not at all the same. And I was really asking myself, this, are we ready to discuss this? And at some point, I felt I'm not ready to discuss this. I'm ready to document it. Yes, but to reflect on it, I can. I, I can just not discuss these things that we live. And I get emotional as we speak, and I don't know if it was shared, but I was like, I can't listen to this. And uh, it felt very powerful, which, and I have taken a couple of notes before about the emotions and effect, and you brought it, Candy, in your talk about the tool you use about narration as a, a tool that allows you to capture the emotion. It's actually designed to capture the break in emotion. And I felt that, ah, oh, this is so interesting. Because in everything you said, there was so much emotion and effect, and I think it's there very much in that project you designed, but I didn't hear the word emotion. And I think you heard it with you, Kenny. And I wanted to ask you about this because the student, you want to hear the video, it's very much there on how they're talking about it, even in some of them in their drawing. You know, they express it, they try to express it in their drawing. And I think in the performance of math, mapping is good too. But I was wondering if, as a framework, Yeah, just, well, just to quickly add on that, I mean, 
having it updated was definitely something that we desired, but um, there is no institutional wrap around this project. Um, so to keep something updated would mean someone managing it, um, and so there were questions of resources and technical ability and capacity that just meant that couldn't happen. And uh, in terms of, yeah, the, definitely as creators, and uh, this project, and I wanted to also be, in terms of the methodology and explaining it, I did, I wanted this website to be as accessible as possible. And we were also, uh, at least with my side as well, experimenting on terms of, and one of the things I love about being an urbanist and engaging architects is that, I'm not me, I cannot draw to save my life, but architects, you know, are willing to get a pen and express things. And uh, so, deliberately to have engagements with 2019 that weren't just textual, uh, I would do the writing, other academics would do the writing, but to have this uh, other way of documenting and to capture exactly as you know, were saying, and the emotive aspects that some people have a difficult time doing through text, but we also have those. But it gives an opportunity to experiment, to use social theory, and to push um, people with other skill sets to articulate that in different ways. Um, we do have the, the syllabus and all of the kind of architecture and infrastructure that went behind these productions, but I wanted to strip that out so that the student work was up front and that there was less noise as, as possible and so the signals were very clear in terms of that student work and knowing, right, because this is very much for an international audience, that as you see from those seven individual ones, but also in the um, collective map, right? I've tried to also explain for those that aren't familiar with them, um, because 2019 happened in a global context, there are global linkages, right? This didn't happen um, with, and again, the video on the historical uh, aspects to this go, go into this, right? This was, of course, there were certain elements to 2019 that are completely distinctive to the Lebanese context, but there are also many linkages that are completely global, regional, um, and uh, even semi-regional. Um, so, you know, it's to also articulate to those that are uh, reading this from Delaware or from uh, Hertfordshire or places, you know, that don't know the difference between Tripoli and Beirut uh, or Jérôme and Zulu and they don't know Arabic and to explain the breadth of this down. That was also what I thought was most important to, to do. Um, I won't say too much more between to move on, but I'll just make two brief comments. Just on the rural urban. As an urbanist, I'm very scared about dismissing the rural. Because it's in like... Lebanon. Even in Lebanon. Even in Lebanon. Even in Lebanon. I, I, I mean, like, this is a day long conversation, but it's I would... Good. You know, we have massive debates and fights over what the rural urban is within urban studies. So, like, I, I tread carefully when completely dismissing the rural, even in urban. Um, and in some ways, especially in urban. Um, and in terms of positionality, you know, you know as, as this is an educational project, positionality absolutely is central to my own work and drawing definitely on feminist theory and methodology, which is very important. But again, it was, as you uh, and to be clear, to forefront the students' positionality in their work um, and uh, also the uh, interlocutors that we engage in this project to showcase their work without too much interference. And that's why I hope the work that I do on, in terms of the journal article and the decentralization aspect, is going to be where my own positionality comes in. Thank you, Dean. Sorry. Thank you for uh, for speaking about emotions, Mona. I'll, I'll start with that. Um, so a bit about this, this uh, these audio pieces. Um, I felt being part of the protest that, like I said uh, in my uh, introduction, that taking photos or taking videos did, wouldn't do justice to what I was hearing on the street. So I, uh, although I was a participant and very much a front liner, also got injured, I sort of developed my own methodology of uh, tracking uh, those who were uh, chanting, uh, and even I like, putting myself into an even greater danger to go and get the, 
the best uh, uh, audio piece or recording uh, simply with a phone. I did not have time, uh, nor uh, 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 I didn't have time to actually invest, although it was something that I was thinking about, oh gosh, who I get proper equipment. Um, I came across Dean and Manny uh, in a cafe last summer, and they mentioned uh, the, uh, the, this work. So I said I have a, an archive of about 200 recordings. So this is how the conversation started, and I made the exception of uh, taking a leap of faith and actually opening this folder, because as you said, I could not also hear it. It was very hard for me to actually hear them, to decide which one to include, to actually hear them and transcribe them and then reflect on them. And I agree, I'm, it's too soon for me and for many people who took part to talk about this moment, but I think it's absolutely necessary. For those who can, uh, they should, uh, if they have the means to do that. What will happen to this work? It's at the moment, um, like I said, it's there. I want people to know that it's there, and one day I would like this to be an open source, accessible to uh, educators, practitioners, citizens, uh, whoever wishes. But at the moment, it's a private archive, but I'm happy I'm happy to share specific, uh, not share as in send, but if someone for a specific purpose would like to listen, then uh, I'm happy to discuss that. On the question of centrality as an urbanist, and adding another layer of complexity as a landscape architect, where borders uh, for me are, can, can, can be insignificant, even urban or rural borders, I will say that, um, there are two things that I think we should uh, remember while discussing the centrality versus the semi-central diffusion um, question. There's the fact that uh, the, the, populace, the, the population, the residents, uh, were ready to, to, to go down to the street because there was an accumulation that was uh, building up throughout, and specifically in 2015, there were many people who were organized in different cities or secondary cities or baby centers or even rural areas, even I'm thinking about Hakka, thinking about the South. So there's this question of readiness and connect connection through the Ustink movement, through a Facebook pages, through Instagram. And also there's a specific uh, series of forest fires, if you remember the forest fire that took place a month before, was it? A few days, a few, few days before, October 7th, yes. yes, and this day. Uh, so there was a readiness uh, and a ready anger and a mobilization that was already building up. So I would, I mean, of course, I would be happy to read the, the word when it's coming to fruition, but I think at this point I would argue that no, it was decentralized, because, uh, or it was uh, happening in, in, uh, together at the same time. Uh, because I don't think that having witnessed what was happening at the same time as we were starting to protest on October 17th in Beirut, things were happening in the south and were happening in Akkar. So I don't think that Beirut or uh, uh, Martyr Square was the central square that diffused. I think there were uh, many, but of course hierarchy, many different squares that were happening and not necessarily squares, highways, roundabouts, triangles, uh, and these with different intensities based on specific events that happened, that really happened. Uh, someone getting killed, a uh, very violent uh, protest. Even the, the square itself in Beirut had many squares. You had Riyadh al-Sabah, Azaliye, uh, then shifted to parliament. Even Sahit al-Nur had different. Uh, so I think all of these uh, uh, locations should be studied in, in their own complexities. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to be very, very quick to answer your question. Uh, intimate legacies. Yes, that's, that's what the, the ultimate question of what literature is for. Uh, what is the use of literature? Here, it's an example of what it is, and that's what I say in the, in the video that I recorded, and the interview that I recorded for the, for the website. Uh, and my text really relates to these, to these maps. Uh, when, I, when I walk, when I write, and, and when I walk in order to write, it's everything that, that, that is engaged within me. 
all my senses are open, including my sixth sense. So I take photos, I, I zoom out on a Google map to see where I am exactly what's around me. I, I do a research on, on, a, on a certain topic. To, 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 I, I make voice notes, voice notes or I take sound bites that I use again when I'm sitting behind my desk to write. And it's the whole body, the whole emotions that, that, are, that are engaged in the, in, the, in the production of the text. I'm not even talking about writing here. The production writing is like a post prod in a way. So, uh, so yes, and, and when, when you walk, you have all kinds of texts that come to you, whether you hear them or read them, whether they are advertisements or signs or, um, or tags and graffitis. Uh, and all kinds of emotions. Sometimes you are uh, happy, and sometimes you're anxious, you're scared, you're angry, uh, and all of these emotions are also part of the text. They are part of the text that the street is producing. Because if you're scared when you're crossing Josh Hadad because it's unpassable for a pedestrian, uh, you, you, you feel it, you feel the fear, you're scared. Uh, and, and it's part of the text that the street produces. Also, when you walk in pairs or in groups and you have a conversation with the person you're walking with, and Jan Sinclair walks with someone, the whole, not the same person, he picks people and he walks with them, the conversation that, is, that these two people are having while walking is also part of the text that is generated by the street. So it's very... Sorry? Which I did. Which I did. Thank you. Uh, can we pass a bit the floor up and take some questions from the audience, please? Okay. Can you just present yourself in a few words? Take a few more questions and then we, we, we answer. Yes, please. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Pat Sharapin and I'm from the University Libraries. Uh, my, my, question, my first question is like um, I didn't hear anything about the tents that really transformed the downtown. Like and the activism that was going on, it was not only protests. Uh, every day, every day there were more than five speakers every night, every night. So if I want to use this as an educational tool, it's not enough. There's something very, very important missing. And also all the NGOs involved. There are 10 or 20 NGOs that were uh, 
very active, very, and how did they communicate, communicate their message to people? So this is missing also. Uh, this uh, term of uh, the tool as a education tool. The other thing, uh, because I'm from the Valley and my colleague here, Eddie Kahari, is responsible for uh, digital preservation. So maybe he has a concern.
understand anger, fully anger. I don't think corruption is a high term, but that's a much, obviously, much longer story. Um, I'm just interested to really understand the heart of the debate here around Germany and that's happening between the, among you guys. You know? Last question. <laughs> uh, my name is Parma. I also teach with uh, May and Dana. Um, I mean, it seems like the, my comment is going to be an obvious one, which uh, somehow uh, kind of is a continuation of the comment of what is lacking from the study of the different kind of components of what created this uh, opposition or this. The energy of the protest. I mean, of course, adding to the soundscape uh, an understanding of the images as they relate to the political message, especially um, that were distributed, I mean, in all kinds of forms, and also the understanding of the objects or the disobedient objects as they formulated themselves by the protesters either by using objects that already exist or by the design of new objects, either by the participants who are protesters or by some designers who kind of created designs that were particularly addressing the formulated dynamics as well as the formulated opposition. And that was done particularly in Lebanon uh, more so, I would say, than other places because the emotion was so high. So linking the text to the emotion, to the image, to the products would be a kind of uh, um, extremely strong, I would think, in formulating this as somehow maybe intellectually very rich uh, aspect Thank you very much. I'm going to try to wrap up. I'm sorry if I'm going to forget any, anything, any part or bits of your questions. Uh, first, there was a question about the theoretical framework and uh, the, the consultation of uh, local uh, sociologists or, or, or experts. Uh, the second was the place of uh, the tense and knowledge circulation. I say tense, but also the egg. In the egg, there was also it was a big university amphitheater, and the role of NGOs in, in this and maybe other elements. Is it present on the website? And if not, why? Um, there was the comment, a very uh, thankful comment from the from the library. Uh, and I'm sure Dean will have uh, uh, you will uh, react on that. Uh, there was a question on the actual really link between. Uprising and social and, uh, and, and urban space. Uh, and finally, there was a question to Sarah uh, uh, on, on her sound bites, uh, whether where we can we can consult them, and the question on corruption uh, that I will try to answer. So I think I should do a better job at explaining the educational aspects of this website. So there, it's two pronged in the sense that. In the production of the website, there was an educational component by those attending the workshop itself. And you can see that articulated in the first video, where the students, so part of this workshop was also visiting UMA, um, which is a research and documentation center I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and also the newly expanded archives at Tech. And to explain what gets put in that process of creating an archive, what is valued, what remnants can be inserted, and, you know, who decides and how. Um, and you can see the students reflect on these various things, and then also to produce various elements to, to then be collated and be expressions of what happened. This is not supposed to be some sort of comprehensive archive of 2019 by any stretch. Um, and then the second part is to then be a tool that I hope is useful to someone somewhere in relation to the history of social mobilizations in Lebanon where I haven't seen a resource 
where the recent expanded scholarship on social mobilizations in Lebanon is put in one place across the long term. So that was a very humble uh, and targeted approach that we wanted to do for the website with the frameworks and, and constraints that we had. Um, but at the same time, to, uh, the, what, on the one hand, the saying is limited, uh, but to respond to the, your questions around the social media aspects and the tent. Um, there are interviews with those that organise the, the tent um, and, and many of the discussions there. Uh, and participate and do reflect. Um, so, just to encourage you to, to look at the, the different layers um, and components that are on the website. Um, it's, they, they are there and there are reflections on social media. Um, but uh, certainly, there's, there's a lot of work to be, to be done there. And, and the, indeed, the wonderful AUB website um, is, is referenced in the, in the website, of course. Um, and you know, this is one contribution of, of many. Um, and there needs to be one contribution of many because there are so many different ways in which to approach this subject, um, whether it be social media, new media, agenda, uh, religion, you know, political economy, um, and different spaces. You know, this is absolutely a drop in the ocean, but um, we have uh, one that is uh, a contributed drop um, and can take carries this, this discussion, which is also, you know, developing rapidly, even, I'm sure the bibliography now that is published on 2019 is out of date. I mean, every week I'm seeing new, new articles, um, but, you know, there were a limited scope and, and possibilities for what this project is, but up to the date we published it, that was, I hope, a good account of the literature that exists on 2019. Um, on the, the local intellectual part. Um, the first workshop was led by Fyder Shane and we chose Vardy very deliberately because of his uh, textual uh, and detailed knowledge of, uh, of social mobilizations in Lebanon and socio-urban spatial dynamics. Um, you know, Fyder is uh, someone who's been very uh, involved with uh, socio-political and urban life here. Um, and he chose to utilize an active network theory approach. Um, and uh, I think that you know, we uh, got very textured and detailed reflections from, from that approach. So it's something that I certainly are very strongly endorse. Um, and then from my personal side, I really wanted to introduce the students at this workshop to the concept of neoliberalism. Um, it's certainly not a concept that is um, born from Lebanon, but it's certainly one that proliferates uh, extensively. Uh, specifically, I mean, that is a concept here that I have traced in terms of its usage, and I can tell you that you know, from the late 90s, it started to be used uh, ever more increasingly. So it was very important for me to uh, introduce that concept because it's also one that has been used very frequently by leftist academics to explain why 2019 happened. Um, so that, yeah, I have to some, some of the intellectual framing. I'm going to pass it to Tessa. Thank you. Um, regarding the uh the, the, the question about whether the data data. yes uh, most of the, the archive is uh, sorted by the time date location but also uh, a description of what was happening the events um, I also have to say that this is accompanied by a writing project of mine which is very personal uh, using the first first uh, pronoun the I. It's a, you can say it's, a, it's, it's in progress, it's a creative nonfiction, and it, and it started with a diary. So I started with the diary of, of course, it's me as I was witnessing things. Uh, uh, I'd be happy to uh, speak with you and maybe give you uh, access to a folder while I'm there, but as I said, it's still um, a private work, but I would love it to be uh, accessible at some point. Regarding your question on uh, emotions, I think another sociologist, 
but I would say that uh, there was uh, sadness and fearlessness. Um, fearlessness, um, I think, as a result of building up, and also we have to say that uh, on, on, you know, if we look at history and, and process of social change, I think some of the people involved um, or organizing had had uh, either very violent, had witnessed violent repression in 2015, so this was the anger, uh, and uh, some of the people involved had uh, uh, actually won a few battles, even if they were very uh, spatial or thematic, like uh, stopping a project on the coast, or uh, so there was some kind of defiance. Uh, so I would say fearlessness uh, and sadness from the forest fires. I really think that the forest fires were very important in uh, this sadness, which uh, which is not related to a person or a human, a human, but to the loss of the forest. Uh, and we can really think lack of lack of maintenance of uh, of like technology, but also. Uh, you know, with questioning identity and belonging in this geography, which we call Lebanon today, uh, a loss of a forest is a loss for everyone. Very romantically, but you know, crosses sectarian barriers, etc. Uh, I just going to have one word: corruption. Uh, you said that corruption was not the only or the source of of uh, people's anger. Uh, we have to go back to the definition of corruption. It would be a, a session by itself. But corruption is the, is the, is the conflict of interest between public and private. Is the use of public uh, interest to, to, to serve the private interest of, of people. It can go from petty corruption that you find in administrations uh, where you pay a few dollars to have your, uh, uh, your formality done to grand corruption that happened at, at the big contrast. But when we talk about private and public uh, interest, it's also, it includes also clientelism, nepotism, uh, interaction with elections, uh, perpetuation of a political class through uh, in power, through all the resources that they, that they, that they, that they have today, uh, economic resources, financial resources, but also symbolic resources, the use of communitarianism, sectarianism, uh, the use of fear of civil war uh, to, to send people back in their homes. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very huge topic that does not only, uh, is not only narrowed down to what we understand from corruption in, in, the, in the mundane uh, language. But I'm happy to, to discuss the conversation further with you. Uh, Mona, do you want to conclude on something? Or? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you again for Yana and Alina for organizing and Perla, she's here. Uh, yes, here. And, uh,